Lord, we thank you and praise you. Thank you for your goodness to us, your grace, new every morning as it is. Thank you for for Lance and Grace, for their presence with us here tonight, and what you have, um, where you've led them, and how you've graced them with your presence in their lives. And we thank you and ask that you would uh, just be with us um, in your spirit of truth. We welcome you, Lord, into our midst tonight. Ask for your leading and guidance today in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple weeks ago, the phone rang, and it was a man that I'd never met. Uh, He said, my wife and I, we've left Mormonism. I said, praise God. He said, well, no, not really. He said, the problem is we can't find Jesus. We know we're losing him, and we don't know where to find him. Can you help? I'd sure like to try, (laughs) you know. So I'm meeting him Friday. This is what it's about. It's it's not huge numbers. It's not the masses. I, oh, that it would could be, you know. But it's it's Rahab in a massive city. It's one Rahab who accepts God and comes to know who He is. That's why we do this, and it has been so wonderful. Uh, I, I'm going to break tonight's presentation into a couple parts. The first part. I'm just going to talk about some realities of what Mormonism has and is doing in people's lives. And then we're going to talk about some solutions. And so the first thing I want to do is, because I tend to be called uh, anti-Mormon a lot, I want to make sure that people know what my sources are. This is my old Mormon quad. If you don't know what a quad is, this is the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, all all bound in one book. So I will quote from this book. This isn't anti-Mormon. This is Mormon. This is a really cool book. It's called In Sacred Loneliness. It was written by a man by the name of Todd Compton. He is a, a Mormon in good standing. He's a Mormon historian. And this book has received two best book awards from two different Mormon literary societies. It's considered to be true. These are two of my sources. My other source is Journal of Discourses. It's like a 40-volume set. Mine's digital. I can't afford the set. And also History of the Church, which is a nine-volume set. So that's also digital in my world. So I just want you to know that everything we're going to talk about today is Mormonism. It is not anti-Mormonism. It is not me attacking. It is me pulling out the truths that come out of Mormonism. Lucy Walker. She was 15 or 16 years old when her nightmare started. She was the third oldest in a family of 10 children. Her father and mother joined the Mormon church, and they moved to Nauvoo, Illinois. And now, when they were first building up Nauvoo, it was a lot of swamp country, and there was a lot of disease there. Sadly, Lucy's mother contracted malaria and died. And while the family was still suffering and and mourning the loss of of a wife and mother, Joseph Smith went to her father and said, if you remain here, Brother Walker, you will soon follow your wife. That's a quote from Lucy. And so he sent this father of these grieving children, sent him away to the East Coast on a mission, and then separated the children. So this family that needed to be together, that needed to have this mutual support, they were separated And the pretty Lucy Walker was placed in his own home. So in her own hand, in her journal, she wrote this. She wrote, why? Why should I be chosen from among thy daughters? Father, I am only a child in years and experience. No mother to counsel, no father near to tell me what to do. In this trying hour, oh, let this bitter cup pass. And thus I prayed in the agony of my soul. Lucy Walker, 1843, a girl of 15 or 16 years old. She also recorded something that Joseph Smith told her. She said, quote, He fully explained to me the principle of plural and celestial marriage. Said this principle was again restored for the benefit of the human family. 
that it would prove an everlasting blessing to my father's house and form a chain that could never be broken, worlds without end. Sarah Ann Whitney was 17. Joseph Smith approached Newell and Elizabeth, this was Sarah's mother and father, to arrange a marriage with their teenage daughter. He was nearly 40, she was 17. Newell, the father, initially resisted having his daughter married to Joseph Smith, and so Joseph Smith went off and he had a revelation from God, which he did a lot. This is the revelation. It's recorded in the church archives. Thus saith the Lord unto my servant, N.K. Whitney, the thing that my servant, Joseph Smith, has made known unto you and your family, and which you have agreed upon, is right in mine eyes, and shall be crowned upon your heads with honor, immortality, and eternal life to all your household, both old and young, because of the lineage of my priesthood, saith the Lord. It shall be upon you and upon your children after you from generation to generation by virtue of the holy promise which I now make unto you, saith the Lord. And if you didn't catch what he said, he said, if you will give me your daughter, I will guarantee the salvation and exaltation of your family, young and old, for generations to come. Joseph Smith was the one who was providing salvation, not Jesus. It was Joseph. One more that I'd like to talk to you about. Helen Mar Kimball was 14. Joseph Smith approached her father, Heber C. Kimball. Heber C. Kimball was a dear friend of Joseph Smith's. Heber C. Kimball was an apostle. And he was the mother of this young child, brother, father. They were related somehow. <laughs> Quit. <laughs> Joseph approached Heber, and they made a plan. They came up with an agreement. Helen didn't really have anything to say about it. She wrote in her journal, after which, speaking of what Joseph Smith had said to her, after which he said to me, if you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. Young girl said this. In each of these cases, Joseph Smith placed the responsibility for the salvation of their entire families generations of their families, all of their kindred. The, the burden of their salvation was placed on the shoulders of these young girls. It was not their burden to carry. They couldn't. They couldn't possibly do that. Not only that, but he told them that if they fail to obey him, that they will be responsible for the destruction of their entire families. And so these girls, not knowing where to turn, especially Lucy Walker, her mother dead, her father sent away, didn't know what to do, and so they became plural wives of Joseph Smith. Jesus alone, as we know, carried that burden to the cross. He alone had the unlimited power to make salvation possible. He alone balanced the scales for us between, between mercy and justice. And so these girls were promised something that he could never give and as you might imagine, it's something that Joseph Smith never paid. He never paid the promised price. Joseph Smith married Lucinda, Pendleton, Morgan, Harris, Zina, Diantha, Huntington, Jacobs, Priscilla, Lathrop, Huntington, Buell. Boy, they had crazy names back then. Sylvia Sessions Lyons, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner, Patty Bartlett Sessions, Marinda Nancy Johnson, Elizabeth Davis Goldsmith, Brackenberry Durfee, gosh, that's a long name, Sarah Kingsley Howell, Ruth Boss Sayers, and Elvira Ann Holmes. These are 11 women that he married. And when he married these women, they were married to other men. Joseph Smith married married women. In several of these cases, actually in most of these cases, the husbands were active Mormons in good standing. In many of the cases, Joseph Smith sent the husband away. In one case, Orson Hyde was an apostle in the Mormon church, and he sent him on a mission to Europe. And while he was serving the church in Europe, Joseph Smith pursued and married his wife. Eleven times he married married women. 
God has spoken pretty clearly about how He feels. We're going to go into the Bible now. If you brought your Bibles, awesome. We're going to start in Exodus. I'm going to move. We got a long ways to go, so I hope you're quick, quick, quick with your Bibles because I'm going to pour through these. In Exodus 20:14, God tells us how He feels about adultery. You shall not commit adultery. We know how He feels about coveting other men's wives. He said it in Exodus 20, 17, and also in Deuteronomy 5, 21. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He was clear about this. It's interesting because Joseph Smith married two sister pairs, Emily Da Partridge and Eliza Maria Partridge, as well as Sarah Lawrence and also Maria Lawrence. He also married a mother-daughter pair, Sylvia Sessions Lyons and Patty Bartlett Sessions. Now, he claimed that his polygamy was a restoration of what had been in the Old Testament times. But here's the crazy thing. If he had restored what had been, we can turn to Leviticus 18, 17, and 18, and we read, You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. We also read, you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister. So if it was a restoration, then those laws that applied in the Old Testament would have applied to Joseph Smith. But he held himself above those. And so why have I told you all of this? It's not because I want to talk about what Joseph Smith did. I want to talk about the condition of the people, that they didn't recognize the wolf in sheep's clothing that they didn't recognize the false prophet, that they didn't recognize the lies when they came, and so they were deceived, and they became involved in horribly sinful behavior. How do people get that way? That's what we're going to talk about. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. John says to us, They went out of us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. You see, almost all of the converts to Mormonism in the early church were Christian. They were Christian, and so they went from Christianity to Mormonism because they were never really Christian. They might have shown up at church. They might have had a Bible in their home, but they didn't have a relationship with God. They didn't know who He was. They didn't know about what Christ did for us. They didn't know the scriptures we have in Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, that tell us how we can identify false prophets. And they also tell us how to deal with those false prophets. So they were ignorant. They were, they were biblically illiterate. And that's why they fell for this. If we turn to Matthew 19, 3 through 9, we see a, a passage that, as we read it the first time, we might think it has nothing to do with this, but I think it has everything to do with this. And so let's go ahead and, and read that. It says, The Pharisees came up to him and tested him, asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart. Because the Israelites had hardened their hearts against God's pattern, which was one man and one woman, because they had rejected what God had given them, because their hearts were hardened, because they were in rebellion, Moses gave an alternate law. So he says, because you hardened your heart, Moses answered, you divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. This passage, on the surface, appears to be about divorce and, and doesn't seem to apply to polygamy. But still, we see a couple of important parts there. We see God's pattern, don't we? We see God's pattern for marriage. 
It's given first in Genesis. It's affirmed in Matthew. There appears to be a contradiction because Moses said, when a man, this is Deuteronomy 24, when a man takes a wife and marries her, then if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts her puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. So, so Moses gave a man the ability to just kind of cast off his wife for any reason. You know, if that was possible, oh boy, a lot of marriages would be in trouble. Well, it is possible today, isn't it? And a lot of marriages are in trouble. But if we live by that law, if there's one thing that our wife does that we don't like, we can cast them off. You know, it took me about five years to teach my wife how to fry an egg that I would like to eat. <laughs> and, and that could be reason enough in some marriages. And uh, she's really great at eggs now, though, I'll tell you. But, uh, but if, if, that's, if that's how we live, we have problems. Moses' law had been given to people that had hardened hearts. And so I think, as I look at it, I almost look at Moses' law because it wasn't God's pattern. God's pattern is clear. This is what he wants. This is his pattern for man and woman, that there be one man, one woman, that they be together. Moses' law was almost like a civil law to me. Kind of a, I, I don't know, I don't want to downgrade what God had given, but it seems like a lesser law, maybe almost a civil law. The problem we have, the problem the Israelites had then, the problem that we have today, is when, when we reject God, when we turn away from God, when we rebel against God, there comes a point where he says, well, fine, do it your way. Doesn't he say that? If that's really what you want, if that's what you've got to have in your life, do it your way. And we see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. It says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. And so when we look at this passage and we see God's pattern for marriage, and then we look at Joseph Smith's polygamy, we don't see anything of God's pattern, do we? And when we look at his palandry, one wife with multiple husbands, when we look at that palandry, we see nothing of God's pattern. When we look at him taking young girls, we see nothing of God's pattern. And then even, sadly, when we see him taking mother-daughter pairs and sister-sister pairs, we don't even see God's lesser law being followed. We see some, some really crazy things. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what these people could have done so they wouldn't be deceived. Acts 17.1 Now these Jews were more noble than those of Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And this, this of course, is when Paul and Silas snuck away from Thessalonica by night and went into the synagogue in Berea and talked to those people. And the crazy thing is the Bible says that they were the most noble, and yet we look at their actions and it almost seems like they were the most rebellious. This was Paul. This was the Apostle Paul. He was shipwrecked and he lived. He was bitten by a viper and he lived. He was stoned to death and didn't bother to die. And when a man fell from a window and died... Paul raised him. If anybody deserved the total devotion of the Bereans, it had to be Paul. But they wouldn't give it. Even the Apostle Paul, the amazing Apostle Paul, everything he said was questioned. And that's how it ought to be. We have a pastor over here, and he doesn't get a free ride, do you? If he says something and it feels wrong, we have an obligation to look. And boy, if you hear anything from me tonight that doesn't feel like God's Word, dig it out and tell me about it. Because that's the way God wants us to work. That's the way the, the, the Bereans were. But that's not the way that the Mormon people were. So Joseph Smith promised Lucy Walker, Sarah Ann Whitney, and Helen Mark Kimball that through him their families would be saved. And because they were blind, because they did not know God, because they did not know 
the words that are in this book because they rejected that and just followed willy-nilly things that tickled their ears. They were deceived and put into a very, very bad situation. And the problem that we see is that they didn't recognize when Joseph Smith said, I will save your family through me, your family will be saved. Now, I was a veil worker in the temple, and I won't get into all of that tonight, but as a veil worker in the temple, I stood on one side of the veil. I stood on the celestial side of the veil that represents the highest degree of the Mormon heaven. And on the other side, there were people that wanted to come in where I was. And I would reach through the veil and I would give signs and tokens and ask for passwords and, and such. And if they were able to come in, or if they did it right, I would let them in. And if they didn't do it correctly, then I would say, no, you can't come. You see, Mormon doctrine says that no one gets into the celestial kingdom, that highest level of Mormon heaven, without a signed certificate from Joseph Smith. See, that's another God. That's another God, because if they have to have that signed certificate from Joseph Smith, what if Jesus says, come on in? Well done, thou good and faithful servant, come on in. And Joseph says, oh, 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 I, I didn't approve this. That's another God that stands above Jesus Christ. And that's Mormon doctrine today. I stood in the place of Joseph Smith and admitted people into that false heaven. Because they didn't know that salvation came only through Jesus Christ. They believed Joseph when he said, I'll take care of that for you. Because they didn't recognize the truth of who God is. They were deceived. Are the Mormon people today, are they under that same kind of deception? Or has it gotten better for them? What do you think? Dallin Oaks is the number two man. Russell Nelson was just made the prophet last year. But he's in his middle 90s. I don't think he's going to last very long. And when Russell Nelson goes, Dallin Oaks will be the next Mormon prophet. Now, Dallin Oaks teaches all the time. He says, not everything that's true is useful. Think about that. Think about that statement, because what that means is we have a pile of truth here, and we can take the truths that we like, and we can push them over here. And we will focus on these truths, right? But this truth, this one, it doesn't fit. That's what we, and we don't look at it. We push that over there. So we have a pile of truth that we completely ignore, and we have a pile of truth that we embrace. Who decides what's true and useful and what's true and not useful? The leaders of the church teach that the church leaders will never lead the people astray. And so, as a member of the church, I couldn't decide what was useful and what wasn't. I had to turn to them. And if I saw something that they did that I didn't like, Dallin Oaks also teaches all the time. He said it so many times I can't count. He says, it is always wrong to criticize a leader of the church, even if the criticism is true. And so this is, what, this is what the people of the Mormon church live under. And because they live under that kind of rule and because they believe it, and because they believe an article of faith that says we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly, and because they have all these prophets that have never identified the parts of the Bible that are corrupt and the parts that are good, the truths that are useful and the truths that are not useful, they've never def defined which is useful. Where does that leave the people of Mormonism? You can't trust any of it because you just don't know which part's goofy and which part's not. This is the burden that these people are under. And they're under that today. They have no idea. <sighs> when, when Grace and I first became Christian and read the Bible for the first time, our, our common statement was always the same. Who put that in here? And how long has it been in here? Because we'd never read it. We had never heard of the day of Pentecost. We had never heard of a Berean. These, these are critical parts of God's gospel. 
We had no idea what Paul said or Silas or Timothy or John. We had none of that. Yes? I thought you did Bible study. We did. I was actually a gospel doctrine instructor. I taught New Testament to the adults. And so as a New Testament gospel doctrine instructor, I would open the manual and we teach from the manual because not everything that's true is useful, but here's all the useful truth in the manual. We would go through and we would read lots of what the prophets and apostles have said. We would read lots of things from the Book of Mormon on the Doctrine and Covenants, and we would read a few proof texts from the Bible. It was just literally proof texts, little bits of things that, that we can see. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example. 1 Corinthians 15, I think it is, talks about baptism for the dead. It's in the beginning, and it's Paul ripping on these people. They say there's no there's no resurrection. He's he's just really tearing them up. And he says, why in the world are you baptizing people for the dead? And then he goes to the back of the chapter and he tears them up again. I mean, this is not, no one wants to be in front of Paul when he is saying those words because he's actually condemning you. And so we had this whole thing where Paul's ripping on them that we never read, but we knew that one little piece in the middle that we picked out and said, Oh, baptism by the, for the dead. Let's do that. James 2 and 18. Faith without works is dead. So therefore, we must have the priesthood. We must be baptized. We must be married in the temple. We must da 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 But you back up 10 verses, and what does it say? Though you keep the whole law and stumble on one point, you're guilty of all of it. They, they know nothing. They have no biblical. And so, in John 8, 24, Jesus said, I told you, that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. In Matthew seven twenty one, starting in 21, it says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I darn sure did. Did we not cast out demons in your name? I gave lots of blessings. Did we not many mighty works in your name? I did that. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. To me, this points to Mormonism. Everything that I've shared with you tonight, I would not recommend that you share with your Mormon friends and family. I shared this with you because I want you to see the condition of the people and understand that, that their thinking, their reasoning is, is as limited today as it was for these women that became Joseph's wives, because when you read their journals, none of them wanted to. But they didn't know where to turn to find a reason to say no. And so they said yes. And, then, and to see that the Mormon people are just as confused. The first pamphlet I have, this is actually the third or fourth in a series of pamphlets that I have. The first pamphlet I have talks about trusting the Bible. And I would really like, if you're going to share something with your Mormon friends, I would recommend that you start with that one. You can go to our website, which is on that pamphlet, and you can click on tracks and then download the PDF and print as many of those as you want. Until you can help your Mormon friends believe that maybe they can believe this book, it's going to be really difficult to make any progress anywhere else. So this pamphlet that we have probably isn't the first thing you want to share but it's something that we can share down the road. And I'd like to just go through it because basically what we like to do with our pamphlets is we like to create pamphlets that we can give to our Mormon friends and ask them, don't, don't try to explain it to them, don't, don't try to have a discussion. Tell them, hey, I've been given this and it doesn't seem to me that it can be true, is it? And so just ask them, give it to them, and ask them, please help me understand what's in this pamphlet. And some of them will read those, and when they do, they're going to come across some problems that are, that are difficult for them. On the cover, I start with a couple of scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. How many gods are there? Well, I'm going to show you some evidence that there might be a few more that or at least might be a few more in Mormonism. Also, we turn to Deuteronomy 13. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder come to pass, 
wherefore he spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet for, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and with all your soul. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Well, there's two parts to this. First part talks about how do you identify a prophet. And the other part is a test for us. If we don't put the, if you don't put the words you heard from me tonight to the test, it says right here that you really don't love the Lord your God. Don't believe me. I am not asking anyone to believe me. Believe God. God only. This talks a little bit about why it's important to not have false gods. Flip the page for me, if you will, to other gods of Mormonism. Joseph Smith taught in June of 1844 from those Mormon sources that I shared with you. says, I want you to pay particular attention to what I am saying. Jesus said that the Father wrought precisely in the same way that his Father had done before him. As the Father had done before, he layeth down his life and took it up the same as his Father had done before. The Mormon doctrine is that our God, the Father, was once a man who had another God, who had another God, and another God. And so we have father gods and grandfather gods and great father and grandfather gods forever. And we have no understanding of where that ends. And so he's saying right here that, that our father became a god and was a god the same way as his god before him. Let's go on. God was once a man. Joseph Smith, in a church stake conference, or a general conference, I guess it was, he said, We have imagined, supposed that God was God from eternity, or from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. Is God an eternal God? My God is. In fact, it's interesting. If you turn to the title page of the Book of Mormon, it says that God is the eternal God. And yet right here, Joseph Smith says, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I refute that and take away the veil so that you may see. The third one down. How was Jesus conceived in Mary? When the Virgin Mary conceived, this is Brigham Young, by the way. When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. Can any of you refute that? Can you say Luke or Matthew? Okay. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who is the Father? He is the first of the human family. Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh, and they teach very vividly about what that means. Begotten the same way that you and I were. Begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden, and who is our Father in heaven? Who is our Father in heaven? Adam. Brigham Young taught that Adam was God the Father, and that Adam came down to and had sexual relations with Mary to produce Jesus. That's another God. That's another God. Jesus was a polygamist. Jedediah M. Grant was the first counselor to the prophet Brigham Young, and he wrote, A belief in the doctrine of the plurality of wives caused the persecution of Jesus and his followers. We might almost think they were Mormons. Now, this is just a little clip from his speech, but he talks very clearly about the fact that Jesus was persecuted, taken to trial, led to the cross, and killed not because he had the audacity to read from the book of Isaiah in the synagogue in Nazareth and say, I am he, I am, but because his many wives offended the Jews. They did not like the idea that he was getting all the pretty girls, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's nuts. The Mormon church hides these things from their people. Most Mormons don't know this. And so... What we want to do with our Mormon friends is we want to give them a reason to go, ah, that's why I have all of these 
sources here so that they can actually go and find out for themselves. They won't believe it from the pamphlet, but if you can get them to say, if you can say, hey, can you help me understand this? They might. God cannot forgive murder. And now behold, I speak unto the church, thou shalt not kill, and he that kills shall not have forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. That's Doctrine and Covenants. That's in my quad right there. And then it goes on to say that David was not forgiven. There is no forgiveness for David. More importantly, well, yeah, more importantly, I love Peter because he couldn't get his foot out of his mouth for most of the New Testament. And then came day of Pentecost and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Jews came and he, Peter came out and he spoke boldly to them and he picked the toughest guy, the toughest Jew in the crowd. I'm sure he did. That's just how I picture it. And he said, you! Accused them of killing Jesus. And then what did he offer them? Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Peter is confirming to us that we can even kill God and find forgiveness. I wouldn't recommend that you try, but but still there's a lot of people that kill him, not in the physical way, but in a spiritual way now, and they can be forgiven, just as those Jews could. Joseph Smith was greater than Jesus. This is another God that scares me to death. He wrote, I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that had ever been able to keep the whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, nor John, nor Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints have never run away from me yet. That is another God. He is saying that he has done what Christ alone can't do. And remember, I stood in his place behind the veil of the temple and admitted people or rejected people from heaven. There's one last thing that I'd like to share. Uh, as, as Grace and I study the Bible, we have become just in... Gosh, we are just so hungry to find these threads that start way back in Leviticus or Deuteronomy and carry forward and connect God's story. It's this tapestry. It weaves together and it's beautiful. There's one that I would just like to share real quick. Go to Leviticus 16, and what you will see there is that Moses is teaching the people about the first day of atonement, Yom Kippur. He teaches several things that connect to Jesus and paint a picture of Jesus, but I want to just share one today. Aaron would go to the blood of the sacrificial animal, and he would dip his fingers in that blood, and then he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. By the way, I don't know a Mormon in the world that knows what the mercy seat is. No clue. But he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and we have a picture of it right there in case you don't know. It's that area between the two angels on the Ark of the Covenant. He would dip his fingers once and sprinkle, twice and sprinkle, three times sprinkle, four times sprinkle. Seven times he sprinkled the blood of the sacrificial animal on the mercy seat. Now, let's join Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. We all know the story. She's weeping. She's already looked inside the tomb and it was empty. She doesn't know where they've carried her Lord. She's distraught. And for some crazy reason, she stoops down one more time and she looks in. And if we were there with her, we would hear <gasps> this gasp that would just echo. Because what does she see inside? She sees two angels, one sitting where Jesus' head had been, the other where his feet had been. Two angels. We now see the real mercy seat. What's between them? The burial clothes of Jesus were, were laid out right there. Do you remember? And in those clothes, there is blood from his head, where they pierced him with a, with a crown of thorns, from his right hand and his left, from his back that they laid open with the flagon during the scourging, from his left foot and his right. Count them. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times the blood of Jesus Christ was sprinkled. It poured out like rain for us seven times. And we see this beautiful picture of who Christ is. 
But shouldn't there be more blood? Shouldn't there be blood from other sources? But this is the beautiful thing. See, for 1,400 years, 1,400 times, the high priest went into the temple and he did the same thing the same way. Seven dips in the blood, seven sprinkles on the mercy seat. Is it possible that Moses got it wrong and God for 1,400 years didn't correct it, that he let his people mess it up? Is that even possible? Somewhere God would say, what are you doing? we got to fix this. For 1,400 years, they did it the same way. But in the Mormon temple, we learn that the Romans nailed Jesus' hands to the cross. And then being worried that the skin, that the flesh would tear, which is kind of funny because by that time, the Romans were pretty good at crucifixion. They had it down to an art. And this time, they, they nailed his hands to the cross and they said, oh, we might have messed up. We're new to this. Right? No. No, they knew how to do it. But in the Mormon temple, we are taught that they also placed a nail in both wrists. That takes the number to nine. And we're also taught that on the cross, Jesus only paid the price for our immortality. That he suffered there so that we could be resurrected only. But the rest of the suffering, the suffering so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be saved, so that we could go and be with God, that all happened in the garden where the Scripture reads that he sweat as if it were great drops of blood. I don't know if he sweat blood or not, actually, because if I run around this building as if I'm a great ape, screeching and howling and jumping on the furniture, it doesn't make me a great ape. And so I don't know if that Scripture means that there was actually blood. Maybe it does. Or maybe it means that he just sweat profusely as if he were pouring out his lifeblood. I don't know. But what I do know is that brings the total number of, of wounds to 10. And so we can ask our Mormon friends, who do you want to trust? We have a pattern that God set that spanned 1,400 years and never changed. We can trust that. Or we can trust the words of the church that has many gods that changes again and again who God is. I would encourage you to share this with your Mormon friends. I've got to tell you, they need it. Maybe those of you that haven't been inside that church, you just don't know how much the Mormon people need this freedom because they are under bondage. I think that's why Grace and I have such a tremendous urgency in this. Even now I'm on the back page. Which Jesus will you follow? It says, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with it. See, this, this actually perfectly describes our Mormon friends because they've received another gospel, another pattern, another way of doing things. And because they are biblically illiterate, just as these early wives of Joseph Smith's were. They put up with it. They bear with it because they know nothing else. We have got to bring them the good word of Jesus Christ and set them free. Have we ever been happier, Grace? How much money would you take to go back? (laughs) So we know that there are many false prophets and teachers out there that are doing exactly that. They're leading their people to something else. Matthew 7.21 Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We've already covered this one. And all the works, all the effort, all the the ritual and the tradition, the, the temple and the priesthood and the marriage and all of those things, we can say, God, we did all this for you. And he says, depart, because I didn't know you. And I will testify to you that when I was in the Mormon church, I believed that I was saved. And even after I came out and became a Christian, I believed that I was saved because I was following Jesus the best way I knew with the information I had. But here's what I know now. This book is very, very worn. These are my Mormon scriptures, Nolan, since you were late. This book is very worn. I poured through it. I spent a lot of time in it. And you can look in the Bible and you won't see much, but you go to the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. And you can't hardly find a place that I haven't marked. I focused on what I knew. And so 
our friends need to know that this is a false gospel and that the only gospel is the one that's unchanged, that doesn't have changing gods, changing doctrines, changing gospels. Again, what I would really suggest that you do is if you decide that you want to use these, don't try to pin them down. Don't make them uncomfortable. Ask their help. They're good people. They're nice people. They're kind people. And they would like to take this and help you understand. But as they go through it, they will discover so many things that they never knew. In fact, all of those things that I shared with you from the different Mormon sources, we didn't know anything about any of them when we were Mormons. Your Mormon friends don't know this. And so we just lay it out. We let them see what it is. But here's the most important thing. The best numbers I can find say that approximately 80% of the people that leave Mormonism become agnostic or atheist. Because they're just like the man that called me and said, we know that the church isn't true anymore, but we've lost Jesus. We don't know where to find him. While all of these are tools, the most important tool you have is your testimony of Jesus Christ, who he is, the message that is the word of God. This is a tool, but without your testimony, it's probably useless. Dear God, we come before you so grateful, God, that, that we know who you are. Not that we can comprehend you, but we know who you are, and we know what you've done for us, and we know that we can approach you in confidence. Knowing that you loved us enough to carry our sin to the cross and to pay that price for us. God, we, we ask you to help us to have a sense of urgency for our Mormon friends and neighbors. God, we also pray that you'll give us a sense of love for them. This is a difficult ministry, and, and as, we, as we try to reach out to them, we do experience more hate and anger than we do success. But God, for those few that turn to you, we, we would pay any price to have that happen. And God, we pray that you will give us that courage, that desire to step out, to reach out, to talk to our friends and neighbors, and, and to give us the words to say when we go. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.